Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to Working to Extract Data in SQL. So today's webinar uh, that we're going to spend the next 45 minutes to an hour on is basically working with SQL. And my name is David Shaw, and I will be your guide for today. So we are going to go through that information. So let me get to um, some PowerPoint here or actually a whiteboard. Um, I do want to want to mention a couple of things first. Uh, down at the bottom of the Zoom, there are some reactions. So if you uh, want to use those reactions for feedback, that's fine. Uh, please use the chat. We're going to uh, limit uh, to the very end a lot of the question and answers. But if you have a question, please write it into the chat window, and then uh, you can um, uh I'll answer that as I go along if I can. If not, we will uh, answer that at the very end. Uh, but I am glad that you all are here. Uh, to start off with on this, I want to start with the SQL, uh, which is the definition, if you're not familiar, is structured query language. It is a language that we uh, write for relational databases, and we'll talk about that here in a second. You all should have gotten a worksheet, and some of the things that are on that worksheet, just as we go through, if you want to jot those down, are some of the key words and the comments. Those were two of the questions that I know that are on that worksheet. To start off with, we have the key words. Um, when we write SQL, it is a programming language. It is a language that we do write into a uh, service um, um, sent out after that. Okay, so these are some of the things that you might want to write down if you want to take some notes while we're going through, but um, the worksheet would be after, uh, after we're done. Uh, Brandon will get that out uh, to you all. Uh, but the key words there, when we're talking about pro when we're talking about a language, a programming language, we have to have these key words, and there are actually five of them. You'll see that over there on the left hand side of the screen, it does talk about the select and the from at this point. Those are required. We have to know where the data is coming from. So once we get into the database, um, we actually pull up. And we write in a select statement that says, hey, select these fields from this particular um, area, uh, table or multiple tables or whatever it might be. There are optional keywords that we can go into as well, the where, the group by, and the order by. The having, if you'll notice, is I've indented that in the group by because the having only goes along with the group by statement uh, at that point. Uh, so we have those five, six key words that you have to remember. And that's kind of nice because we don't have to remember a lot in this programming language, like some of the other programming languages out there, VB, C++, C Sharp, all those other ones, there was a whole list, even GW Basic, they had to memorize these key words to even just be able to do something. So in SQL, to pull out data, and that's what we're trying to do, we're trying to write these SQL queries to be able to pull out data as we go along. Now, one of the other things that I mentioned in the worksheet or I put in the worksheet was the commenting, and that's kind of nice to be able to do. And you'll notice over there on the uh, right side of the screen, it does talk about the comments. There's selecting all fields, and all you do is put two dashes before. And you'll see this as I bring up some SQL statements uh, and run those for you uh, here in a bit. And you also notice that we can do inline comments, which are hey, I'm going to select this from the customer table, but I want to document what's going on. And one of the things I found in teaching SQL to students is that students will write queries and want to share those queries with other people. Or you might write a query um, and somebody else gets a hold of it and you're gone from that position and they're taking over that query. Well, if that case, you want to make sure that they know exactly what's going on. And comments are a good way to do that. We can also write all of our queries on one page. We don't need to have separate queries uh, saved as we go through. 
And we can do that by commenting out a large portion or a previous query we might have run by using the slashes and the asterisks in order. So slash asterisk at the start, asterisk slash at the end, and that gives us me gives me multiple lines. That way, I don't have to go in and do uh, the dashes in front of each line as I did in the first example up here. Oh, wow. So down below, I put in a relational database. And so at this point, when we talk about relational databases, we talk about databases or a bunch of different tables of data. Um, a good example is this, the sales data here for, say, a retail store, if you want. Here's a customer table that has customer information, has the customer name, has the referred by, a number associated with it, an address, a city, state, zip, and a rep ID. There's also a sales table, and we can combine these two together based off of, and I'll just draw the line, the customer number. And I can pull information from both of these. If I were to do this in Excel, which is one of the reasons why we go to relational databases, I would have to have one line of information that has this over and over again, all the customer information and every time they ordered something. And then I would have to do it from the titles. And this is an author's database that we use in class, but there's part number and it too has a link or a commonality between these fields. That makes it relational. So that when we go back and we start using multiple tables and try to extract information from this table and this table, we can pull that information out versus a flat file type database which is what Excel is. So we're new, now moving one step above this. We're going into the relational databases. So to give you an idea of some of this, I've actually got a lab that we use, not there, wrong one. There we go. There is my lab. And so one of the first things I have to do is I have to connect to that server. And once I do that, I can go ahead and connect and that brings me into, into the server list. And over here is what's called an object uh, explorer. It's basically everything I can connect to on this server. So in an organization, somebody is going to be the DBA, DBA standing for database administrator. And what they're going to do is they're going to put together the tables inside of a database. So when I expand this, I'll zoom in just a little bit so you can kind of see this. You'll see the databases over here on the Explorer. And here is Pub1. And when I expand that, you'll notice that now I have a listing of all the tables that are available to me. Database object is DBO, and there's customer, there's uh, obsolete titles, the potential customers, sales, salesperson, and titles in there. Those are the tables that I have available to me. I can click on these and expand them, and I can show the different columns. I don't know if it's going to allow me to, I think there's a zoom down or a scroll bar down. Oh, yeah, that's what I was looking for. I wanted to go up just a little bit. There we go. You can see in the customer's table, we have customer number, the refer by the customer name, address, city, state, zip code, and rep ID. And so again, when we're in class, we, we take a look at these different items because we want to know what those items are. Because you can't, you have to know the background of the database. You can't just make a query. I just can't query this data. I have to know the scheme of it or what's in the, in the different tables to be able to call that in the programming code in the SQL query code that we're going to write. Now I have an SQL query. Let's see, let's back out of this. I have a page that I will go ahead and open up. It's on my desktop there, there we go. So now I have, have a query written 
and I'll just go ahead and select it. And what you'll notice is that when I select this line, I have a bunch of different codes on down, but I'm gonna go ahead and just select this line. Now I've already selected the pub one at this point. And so that's the table or the, not the table, but the database that I'm looking for in the, off of this particular server. And this server may have multiples in here. So you have to make sure that you're picking the right one at this point. So there's SP underscore help. And basically what this does is when I run this query, so I already have it there, I'll execute it. This is actually going to give me information about that particular table. So there's the customer number, there's the different data types, we have to also be wary of the data types because is it a date, is it a number, is it a, a text field of some kind, and there's several different ones as well as the length of those because then it may cut off information or not, not show us all the information if it's not all there because of the structure of the table itself. And again, we're not worried so much about that structure because that's what the DBA is putting together. I don't have to be the DBA to be able to run this. I never put this database together, this pub one. All I'm trying to do is run code that extracts that information out for me. So here is the SP underscore help. I can do that for any table name. So I could change this to uh, what's another table there, sales. And it would show me if I select it and then execute it. Then it goes ahead and shows me all the sales information. And so again, from that whiteboard uh, that I had up previously, that's all the sales information that was incorporated into it. The column name, the type, the com is it computed or not, the length of it, if there's a uh, currency in there, or in this case, quantity was an integer, is there uh, a length of it, is it uh, got decimals, things like that. That's all the structure, that's part of the schema, knowing what I can pull from table A and table B at the exact same time within a query. Now that's just one of the ways that I can do these, uh, get this information. I have it also again, where I had it over here on the left-hand side, and so once I've done that, I now need to go in and start in a query itself. And as I mentioned, there are two key words, select and from. Now, several, you can write this any way that you want this particular query, it doesn't really matter. But in this particular case, I'm just doing a select and from at start. And that way I can go ahead and put in the table name. So if I did customer, there it is. I can select customer off the list. Once I've done that, now I don't have to go back and put the word customer in front of each one of these. And sometimes people do that. The, specifically, when we have multiple tables, you'll see where it says customer dot customer number and then sales dot customer number because they're trying to pull it from the exact table it is. In this particular case, I can go ahead and put an asterisk. An asterisk gives me all fields, or I can specify specific fields. So when I go ahead and select this and execute, there is all of my customer information going down. There's only 25 of them, but it's showing me customer number, refer by customer name, address, and so on. So I'm starting to pull that information out and I'm doing it one step or two steps at a time, if you will. So let's just do a customer name. There we go, customer name. And you can see the difference there where now all I have, well, that was interesting. Wonder why that did select, it's customer name, there we go. Custom Cust name. I get the right one. I should have looked over there because it's right there. But when I execute this, I have too much select not selected. There we go. Now I'm just pulling out their actual name. So I have just that information. Now, if I did for sales, so we can go from sales and we can see what's up here. I think it's a uh, customer number. There we go. Ah, 
Got to select the first. There we go. Yes, that select. All right. So it's just giving me the customer number. Maybe I can do quantity. So we have quantity off of that as well. And again, select this, execute it, and there's the quantity from each customer. And then we can start adding on more and more of the key words as we go along. Good example of that would be down here where we start doing a conditional search. What we're doing here is performing conditional search, but we're selecting the part number, the, B, the book titles, the sales price from the titles table, right? And I'm looking for all sales prices that are greater than $50 in this case. So if I go ahead and select this, there is my result of those three. Those are the only three that are uh, at $50. And so again, you can go through and say, all right, well, I want to do this, where I'll comment that out. And now I get everything at that point. So as I'm extracting this information, as I'm looking for this information, I can do them in steps. And that's one of the things I can suggest doing when you're running an SQL query is doing it step by step. First keywords from and select the where, that's an additional added bonus, all right? The where clause. I have another one here where it's gonna do a calculation. So what you're seeing now is the 0.07 as discount price. We can make up things as we go along. And I'll just run the first part of this. There's a calculation that tells me what the part number is, what the title is, and what the discount price is. And if I want to, I might go ahead and put in sales price. Uh, there it is. I ah, didn't want that. Let me just back that out real quick. There we go. Put a comma there, separate that. Just so you can see the difference on that one. Uh, we've got too much there. There we go. Red underline was telling me I didn't have the correct fields. That's why I go and put the from first, because then if I'm doing the typing of these fields, it's going to go ahead and show that to me as being misspelled. So if I do it now, we'll have one extra column in there. So you can see the original sales price and the discount price. So what this is stating here is actually a alias, what we call an alias. And so we're giving this calculation and showing that as the discount price. So very similar to the previous one, where we were actually looking for everything above $50. Now we're bringing this down to looking for everything above $45 as we're still doing our calculation. So when again, when I run this, there are the ones that are above $45 now. But we're doing comparisons using greater thans, we're using equals, but I also wanted to show while we're doing this that we can make calculations in the query as necessary. This is not the only types of query, uh, calculations that we can do. And I'll show you those uh, a little bit farther down. This one is actually taking sailing. Sailing is a keyword. And so what I'm looking for in the title is books that are called sailing. Now, the difference here is this is a term in a book uh, title, so it has to be, it's text, it has to be enclosed in single quotes. So we're looking for the part number, the title, the sell price from the titles table where that title is equal to sailing. So again, as I select it and execute it, there is the book named sailing. You can see that down here. 
as I scroll in, they're sailing. It's part number 40122, $29.15 uh, $29 as the price. We have multiple criteria. So what happens if I want sailing and I wanted art and I wanted, you know, fishing and any other book like that, where I wanted the listing of them? What you're noticing here is a select statement that's going to select everything from the customer table, but we're using what's called an in statement. Otherwise, I'd have to write that with an or statement. I'd have to say where state is equal to California or state is equal to uh, New York or state is equal to Massachusetts. Instead of doing just, just this or statement, this long, long or statement, we can use a keyword or key phrase here uh, situation. We can use what's called the in. And when we do that, again, this is text. So it's showing us that we had to put those in single quotes for each one of the states. So if I just do this, here's all my customers. There's all 25 of them. But now when I go back and rerun this, there's now a listing of 11 of them out of the 25. So a little bit, uh, a little bit less than half of my customers come from these three different states at this point. So the end statement is going to allow me to find this information. Now, this may be a lot, lot simpler than some of your tables that you might have to work with. But again, we're trying to extract this information, narrow it down. If I've got a million customers uh, because I've got a sales book or I have previous customers I'm grabbing information from or even products, I worked with Pet, uh, PetSmart here in Phoenix, and they um, their their uh, inventory list is rather large. You know, their buyers are working just with certain categories. So when I teach classes and I te talk to the buyers, I might have a buyer of dog food, but they're working with just one brand of dog food because there's just so many products. You've got different sizes, you've got different flavors. You've got sizes and flavors, and you've got different types, dry food, wet food, all kinds of things. So their product list are rather large. They might have two manufacturers at most. To have all that on a, on, in a table, um, we want to extract based on certain qualities or criteria that we put in. And that's where the where statement comes into play. We can narrow that field down to find just one manufacturer. We can find just one uh, state of customers or city of customers or zip codes. We can start narrowing down zip codes. Um, it could be anything uh, in there uh, that we're looking for. And in this case, I'm looking for multiples of California, New York, or, or Massachusetts, but I'm using the in statement to do that. Once we have that, we have aggregates. And this is a rather long one. So again, I... Uh, Try to type a lot of this out ahead of time to show you. But what you're noticing is a longer statement for aggregates. We have counts, averages, sum. That aggregates that information. So this one's going to be a little bit different. If I was just looking to find out how many rows of information in the sale in the titles, well, I've got 92 or 99, one of the two, I think it's one of those numbers in there. So that's going to tell me I have a count of uh, how many product titles I have or, or book titles I have. Um, I have how many sales titles, uh, sales uh, uh, prices. Uh, I want a count of these. So it's going to roll it all up into one line, an aggregate cost going to tell me how many how much these total costs of my dev cost are or development cost it's going to give me an average of those costs it's going to tell me how many i have in the dev cost which should be equal to the number of rows but it's not going to be equal to the distinct because we can run a distinct on there so i could actually go back to the previous one and say all right i want distinct states it would show me three that i have one i have people from california Massachusetts, New York, but it's only going to give me one item back from each of those. Now, this one, when I run it, show you the line that I was talking about. 
there is the one line down there at the bottom. So you can see that we have 92 rows, we have 92 different titles, 92 different product counts, but we have on pricing, we have 43 distinct prices. So half of them, thereabouts, a little less than half of them are duplicate pricing. You might have books at $15 or three or four different titles if, if that much. So we're now getting a distinct. We have 87 develop, de, uh, development costs because I know in this one, there's like four or five of them that are null values. So we're not seeing that. The total cost is $967,082 or actually $96,000. Yeah, $967,082.68. The average development cost of these titles are $11,000, a little over $11,000. And we're getting that in one line. Again, I can take this information, then go and take it back into Excel if necessary as a CSV file. I can take it over to Power BI and I can do any of the visualization that I need to. I can plot this information uh, for a year. I could do dates. I could do different calculations on that. And we can have a little bit more of a picture format rather than just having numbers in the file itself. We have, um, let's see, oh, well, that was just for the year. I didn't even catch the year. So this is actually a calculation for the date part, which is actually going to show me the year uh, versus the pub date. Okay, so we're pulling out the publishing date and the year that need to be equal to 2017. So again, let me scroll this down, bring this down a little bit. There we go. So I can catch everything on that one. And we'll execute that. And now we've got some different numbers. So what was done in 2017 only was 56 out of, uh, out of the 92. Uh, we had, again, same amount of titles, same amount of prices, no null no values. Um, we've got three null values in VEL cost, uh, development cost uh, uh, field. And we have 31 out of the 56 that have distinct prices. So we don't have quite, we don't have quite as many duplicate values uh, as we did before. And again, about the half the cost on the development cost and uh, same on the average is about the same though. It's 11,100 where the other one was 11,114 or something, uh, just because of the one line, the one extra line that we had in there. So let me go back up, back down, there we go, and show you another type of function that we can do. So this is another one that is showing dates, all right? Um, and you can see a little bit of the date uh, issues here. We've got uh, date functions. So we're going to select the title, the pub date, the date part, and the date diff. Now, I do want to explain what's going on here. When you have... SQL query, and depending upon viewing, this is some of the options you can do inside of query uh, SQL, the management studio uh, that I'm working with. Uh, you'll notice that we're sep separating the lines, but we're putting the commas between the fields that we're looking for. So this is going to return four fields, the title, the publishing date, a date part, the year of the publishing date, and a date diff from get date which is actually getting the system date, it's going to bring back that as a public as the age, but that's the date difference, okay, from the year of the publishing date from today. So publishing date, the difference between the get date, that will be that year, and it'll give us as an age a value in there uh, from the obsolete titles, okay, where the date part from the date pub, the year, between 1994 and 2003. So if there's books that were greater than 2000, uh, 2003, like 2004, 2005, not included. This is another way to utilize multiple criteria in your where statement, the between and the and, between this value and this value. So it's greater than or equal to this 1994 and less than or equal to 2003. And you could have written it that way as well. You know, 
instead of using the word between, but it's a little bit easier. So we're bringing back four fields right here. And with these four fields, um, we're separating them line by line because we have a lot more information on each line. So it makes it a little bit easier to organize this and figure out what's going on with this particular query. So it's just another way to write this. It could be on one line with a comma after each one of these uh, on, this, on this line going out uh, to the right side. So let me go ahead and select this to give you an idea of what this return is going to be. So when I execute it, here's the title. In fact, we only have four of these inside, or seven of these inside. But here's the publishing date. Here was the year, 2001, 2000, 1997. Uh, there's the year and the age from today. So if you were to count from today, there are exactly 22, 22 years and about, uh, I don't know, three or four days. <laughs> Uh, going into that, that's 26 years uh, difference. There's 24 years from today. So it tells you how old this particular book would be. And again, I can take this result and I can export this out as a file. And to do something along that line, I am going to go to, uh, I want to make sure, there we go, file and... I need to do my file and my, where was it, David? Uh, yeah, my as. And I can go ahead and save it as text files. So now that it's saved as a text file, I have that information. I can also do this from the top as well. And I'm trying to remember the icon, the specific icon. There's the results to file uh, and results to text. So right now we're doing it to query at this point, right? So again, we have that information saved somewhere else uh, as that particular file. And there was one more place I was thinking of. But I'll have to come back to that. All right, a couple more. There's the organization. By default, usually things are done by the keyword or key value. In something like this from the titles, the biggest thing would be the part num, part number. And they've just shortened that down to part num. The part number in this particular one is not showing, but that would be the default way of organizing this. In this way, we're putting in the keyword of order by the sale price. So we're now organizing this first by sale price. And when there's duplicates, it's then going to do a descending order. I'm sorry, the descending is on sale price. It's going to do the ascending on the title. So when there's duplicate sale price, it will take the, take the sale price or put these, put these in sale price order. When there's duplicates, it will then look at the book title and put those in alphabetical order. There we go. Got to make sure I'm saying that right. So now we see that here is the sale price in descending order. When there's duplicates like more home repairs and the complete football re uh, reference, it's now putting the more one in front of the because that's in, descending or in the ascending order as we go through. So this is an example of using the order by to get this information. And again, once I have this information, I can go ahead and utilize this in other applications. So again, I'm trying to extract this by writing these SQL queries. This is a group by. So in this particular case, this is going to group by the rep ID. So if I just run this and kind of get an idea, I'm just going to run this without the group by. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. You can see the rep ID N01, N02, 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 N01, N02, 2, 1, 2, S03, uh, O2, O2, W01, so on, so on, and what there are. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to put that together and group those by the ID. 
Did I not do, I don't think I had to do that because they were telling me I didn't have to, but we will do that. Try this again, grouping it by sales rep. Well, that's just a how to do. That was supposed to work. Gotta love when your query doesn't work right off the bat. So let me check something real quick. Maybe just select the rep ID and leave out the quantity and customer number. Yeah, I, I think know. we have to use the same columns we use in our selector statement. Yeah, you should group by. You though. Yep, it should work now. Yep. Yeah, you're getting that, but you're not getting the total of the information down there. So let me. see if I can get my example. I've got it on another page. Um, with the organization, did I not copy everything down? I should have, there's the order by, the group by, order by, order by, rep ID, that should have. Let's try this one, copy this one over. Can't copy into here, Dave. Let's try this. Oh, two commas and custom. Thank you. And I can't spell so or type, so that's not going to help. But that is there. Should have been able to get the number of sales, though on the quantity and customer number. All right, not a problem. And then I'm gonna add one more item on that, which is the having by or having a sum of the quantity that is greater than or equal to 2000. And instead of having the eight down there, now we should get a different number. Now we're down to five by customer. It's really weird that that first one didn't work. It should have worked, but that's all right. I'm trying to see uh, other ones, but that that kind of gives you an idea about the group by and the having, and again, doesn't have to worry about case being case sensitive, uppercase, lowercase, your, your typing. You, you notice I got proper case in here uh, from a different one, but it gives you an example of that. That was the second example on that. Now, going back to the relational table, and I'm just going to go back and pull up my whiteboard real quick because I do have something down below of the different types of joins. These are a couple of different joins here where we've got rows with matching rep ID, sales and salesperson. The output between those is what's called an inner join. You also have what's called a left outer join, which would be on the left-hand side. So when you have titles and sales and you're trying to pull information about this, 
we're looking for the output of the titles and the sales in this case. So we're getting the left output. We might have to all the titles, but only where uh, there are sales on the side. So it'll give us a sales dollar quantity, whatever we're looking for in, in that case, what customer bought those. And we can do that. The opposite side, the right outer would give us all sales, but only titles where there was a sale. It's almost the same thing as an inner join at that point. And the example that I was bringing up in here is this is the multiple tables. So let me zoom out a little bit, get to my scroll bar so I can scroll down. In here, here's the multiple tables. So this would be what's called an air join, very similar to what you just saw, where we're selecting the order number, the sales date, the quantity. But here's that dot, that sales dot rep ID, the first name and last name from the sales table. And we're joining that on the salesperson and the rep ID. So we've already got the rep ID here, sales. And this is the other table that we're doing, which is a salesperson table, to be able to pull that other information like uh, first name and last name. So it knows where those two tables join. What is that common field in the relationship? So in that particular case, I can go ahead and select that. And when I execute that, uh, here are the different salesperson's names. Here's their order number, how much they are in the rep ID. And you can see the, du the duplicate values in there. So again, I can do other things with that when I do have that information uh, that, that I export out. So that is to give you an example of an inner join. The other one that I had was on this one, and this is another way to write it. This is selecting the titles and how many we sold uh, as the total quantity. We're doing what's called the left outer join from titles onto sales. And the key field between those two, as I mentioned, I drew the lines was titles and sales was on the part number. So when I run this, I will now get an execution here. Uh, here's how many I totally sold on all kinds of knitting, uh, basic home electronics, uh, boating safety. And again, there's some nulls in here because why? We didn't sell any of those books uh, as we went through. So there are some of my uh, items that I have. And again, I want to uh, be able to um, take that information, I can save, save the, the um, queries in here. So I can save this as a query. And by default, when you set up a new query, it actually just saves it as query one, SQL query one, SQL query two um, for that. We do have the ability to save them as text files or any other type of files as well. And for some reason, I am missing my exports. And I know it's there somewhere. And I just had a brain loss on this because I was looking to export this out. Results to um, a file. So let me reselect something here. Quick question while you're doing this, Dave, yes. if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, but I mean, when I write a query, I used to, and I used to, I never wrote inner or outer. I just wrote join on so and so. What does that default to? Does that default to an inner join, I would assume? Um, I don't know why. I do know that we're trying to form the join is going to be the inner join. You have right. to specify the left or the right to get the, the other joins. Now, there are other ways of doing this where you can combine data, and there's the union as the key word uh, that goes forward. And then you can do um, one of the other key words in there um, instead of like an inner join, you can do a union, but you have to specify table A and then table B with the same select statements and from statements on both of those. But what you do is you unionize those or combine those two together. Does that help out a little bit? To some extent, yes. 
Thank you. And then you have one called, um, the one I was looking for was accept and intersect as well. Uh, those are two mm. other ones that, that do that. Um, kind of similar to the unionized, but it's then how do you structure the, the, query, the query statement uh, that you're writing to? All right, I was trying to do one thing with this data. And um, yeah, we'll do it this way. We can go ahead and save the results. And there's where we can bring up the file. I can save it as a CSV file or a text file. So if I save it as a CSV, um, and I'll just give it a name of webinar. And where did I save that, Dave? That's another good question. I got saved in the documents. And I should be able to go to, I'm not sure what they have on here. They have Excel. They don't have Excel on here. Um, WordPad, I know it's on here. Under MS Office. Um, that's the online version. You got to log into it uh, for that one. Should be WordPad. Should be able to take that and open it up. Next doc. I saved as a CSV though, didn't I? All right. Let's cancel that for a second. We'll save it as a text file. Now, when I open up WordPad, I can open up that document. Same information here that it is over on the other side. Because now I can take it to back to Excel if I have Excel opened or if I have Excel on the computer. I can take it to Power BI. Some of you might be running Tableau to do your visualization. But again, I can narrow it down and do whatever I need to do. I don't have to bring all the records over like I just did. This is all 92 of them. But I could have said, don't bring the ones that are null with this information. And that's the idea behind what we're trying to do is we're, we've got this database, this SQL database out there, and we want to go through and show some of these different ways where we can extract some of this information. Once we get that information, we can put them into a file. And then with that file, I can go to other applications and do something with it. Visualization, which is the big key nowadays, uh, the BI world, uh, analytics, you can now take your you know, million, million records, two million records, five million records, whatever you have and narrow it down so that you have a subset of it using the SQL. And then you can push that off to the other side. You do not have to use Microsoft, um, the uh, management studio either. The same commands, little tweaks though, you might be using Google uh, BigQuery. Um, for the most part, everything I just did is written the exact same way in BigQuery. You just now store your data in Google's cloud storage, very similar to Azure SQL, um, the mainframe uh, storage that Microsoft has. Uh, BigQuery is the same way on the Google side. Any other questions? Was this new for most people? Did we get something out of this? Oh, yes. Hey, this was awesome. First time I'm using SQL. Really helped to understand it much better. Thank you. Okay. I just want to point out that, yes, I did do seven hours worth of class in about, so oh, I don't know, 45 minutes. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's kind of a quick, quick an overview, if you will. But um, we do have classes on uh, part one, part two. But that's all we're doing is 
going through a lab, you're seeing the lab environment as well. And so that should help you out, give you an idea if you're uh, interested in that. I know Brandon's got some other information for you. So at this time, Brandon, do I turn it over to you? Yeah, at the, after you exit, you are going to be given a survey that you can just fill out. It's asking if you'd like to continue the conversation. That's meaning, would you like to learn more about what New Horizons offers in terms of SQL and other resources that we have? So if you are interested in that, please click yes, and we'll get you connected with an account executive to be able to discuss what your needs are and what resources and courses that we have that you can then take. So um, I think we do have a question. So yes, um, Ann. go ahead. Go ahead, Ann. I see the, the hand not hearing anything though. And good, Jeff, I haven't worked with Oracle, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that there is some crossover. I worked with big, big, uh, big query from Google. So, and did you have a question there? Oh. I can sort of hear. Can you hear now? Yeah. It said it connected to a headset. Sorry about ah. that delay. All right, I'm trying to find out if I haven't had class in SQL since 97 and I'm doing Power BI now, um, which of the classes I might wanna take? Um, do you need to, I, I think that would be a case that you might wanna take a look at the outlines to see where that falls into. If you've been doing uh, SQL. I've been doing queries for decades with different software. We and I don't know what's most saleable. I'm a contractor. And... Um, you have, there's Power BI. I don't, I can't remember if they talk about in the Power BI certification class or not. If, I'm certified. And you've taken that test. All right. Yeah, I got um, certified and I took the SQL class um, in 2019. And I need I've been using SAP, Oracle, and SQL Server, but I'm not well versed in the SQL currently for any of them. Yeah, that might be a conversation you would have with an account executive, um, because if you're already certified, I don't think the SQL stuff classes would be very much help for you if you've been doing that. The, the four-day Power BI class would be the only way, but I don't know if they talk about the the SQL connection um, very much or very deep. Uh, a lot of what we talked about here applies over there, but there's a lot more to it or a little bit more to it. Uh, it's just not a lot there in the SQL. It's more of for Power BI uh, on that side. Your next step would be uh, doing DBA type classes and things like that, maybe. Including SQL? Okay. Well, the DBA stuff would be involved in SQL. So that's, we're talking about the administration, the creation of the databases, things like that. But again, an account executive might have a little bit more information than I would. Okay. They didn't really know two years ago. I'll find out what I can. All I'll right. Look, I'll look at the descriptions. Microsoft has help on what the subjects are. Yeah, they have, um, you remember that Microsoft's also gone to some of the um, more of the job title versus just the generic, uh, yeah. generic certifications. I know. Okay. I will find out what's available and evaluate that. All Thank right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Brandon, it's all yours. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.